I hate Jeff Bezos, but at the same time, his story is remarkable. From working at McDonald's and being a lonely loser to creating a trillion dollar empire, where almost all major online companies rely on Jeff Bezos and Amazon to stay on the internet. But you see, Jeff Bezos doesn't just control the internet, no, he runs an actual empire. With his fingers in books, groceries, pharmaceuticals, the media, the military, and the CIA, just to name a tiny few. Not to mention all the other companies that Jeff Bezos has shares in. And by doing all of this, Jeff Bezos has amassed more than $130 billion in just personal fortunes. It's no wonder he has a seat on the board of the Pentagon. No wonder his dick pics were covered up and supported by the media. There shouldn't be any shock that he doesn't pay any income tax. But the real question is, is what's fueling this empire? How is he allowed to be a modern day robber baron without any consequences? And what actions did he have to take to get in the position he's in today? Well, when you reveal the veil of Jeff Jeff Bezos' true power. When you pull that curtain back and see what's really behind his fortunes, trust me, it's nasty. Jeff Bezos was born to Ted and Jacqueline Jill Jensen on January 12, 1964. The family lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Jeff would spend the majority of his early years. Jeff's real biological father was never in the picture, as Jeff's father left when he was only one year old. In fact, Ted never actually knew who his son really was until he was eventually contacted for a book interview in 2014. Jeff's mother would eventually go on to marry Michael Bezos, and both her and her son would end up taking his last name. From a young age, Jeff was clearly an extremely smart kid, with obsessive interest in technology and construction. Construction. He spent all his summers working on a farm with his grandfather, where he learned how to be self-reliant when it came to building things and fixing machinery. And back in school, Jeff was excelling in his academics and was placed into the gifted program at his high school, even being named valedictorian of his year. And whilst in the school, he would earn money on the side by working at McDonald's. During his shifts, Jeff would hyper-focus on whatever task he was currently doing, paying specific attention to customer service and the automation process. He later explained that even at McDonald's, he never worked thinking about the present. His mind was always focused on future plans. And these plans were far from small. After being fascinated by the moon landing, he wanted to become a space entrepreneur and often told his teachers that the future of mankind is not on this planet. Jeff's interest in conquering space would be a lifelong ambition, but this dream of going into space was still a dream. Jeff still needed to graduate high school, and once he did, Jeff had the grades and finances to get into pretty much any higher education he wanted and would eventually decide on the University of Princeton in New Jersey. He would initially pursue a degree in physics, but quickly decided to switch over to engineering and computer science. Similar to his previous education, he was academically among the top in his class and was later offered jobs at Intel and Nokia once he received his degree. However, Jeff instead decided to try working at a telecommunications startup called Fitel. He would eventually land a job at DE Shaw & Co hedge fund when he was only 26 years old. Once he was working at this hedge fund, Jeff rose rapidly through the ranks. And bear in mind, this was during an economic downturn in the 90s. Jeff's rise in DE Shaw was extremely impressive to all his co-workers. He was working with some of the most prestigious hedge funds in America, in one of the most cutthroat industries in the world, and still managed to land on top. Despite all the competition he was facing, both with other employees vying for limited high-ranking staff positions, as well as all the external strife against other competing hedge funds. Even with these challenges, Jeff Bezos somehow became the youngest senior vice president in DE Shaw's history, after only four years of working at the company. It was in this time working at DE Shaw where he would pick up crucial financial managerial skills that would eventually translate to his eventual success with Amazon. He would later explain that the managers at the investment firm, namely its CEO David Shaw, taught him all about, quote, things like HR, recruiting and what kind of people to hire. Jeff was having so much success in Wall Street that he would likely have stayed in that area for the rest of his career. But in this time, the internet was rapidly growing. Almost no one was really paying attention to it. But Jeff couldn't ignore the staggering growth of the internet. This was his opportunity to shine. He was enthralled by the consistently increasing online stock numbers, along with the investment potential of the internet after it had been growing at a rate of 2,300% annually. And so in 1994, Jeff told his boss about the idea of leaving DE Shaw and launching an online startup. But of course, in this time, the internet was still seen as a novel idea, an idea only for the computer nerds. Which is why when Jeff told his boss this, he was met with tons of discouragement. In fact, Shaw told him that this idea was better suited for quote, someone who doesn't have a good job, and that he would not only be giving up a pivotal role at the firm, but also his financial security. However, despite these warnings, Jeff would eventually leave DE Shaw in 1994 and would soon go on to conceive his first business, Amazon. And it was also during this time that Jeff wanted to get married. He tasked his friends to set him up on countless blind dates. In fact, it was so many that he was 
quote, somewhat of a professional blind data. But of course, we're talking about Jeff Bezos here. And Jeff had an expansive list of criteria his future wife would need to meet. One of which being they could quote, get him out of a third world prison. And of all the girls he was selecting, Mackenzie Scott met his criteria. And they would eventually get married after only knowing each other for around six months. It seemed like his life was perfect. A normal, ambitious man with a loving wife and a great career. At this point, anything was possible. Jeff was filled with meaning. And the optimism for his new startup was high. But Jeff still needed a name for his company. Maybe leaning a little too far into his business mindset, he was originally going to call Amazon Relentless. Jeff only got rid of this name when his friends convinced him that Relentless sounded a little too sinister. And also because the name Amazon would be at the top of the directory lists. So this brings us to Amazon's founding in 1994, which started with $300,000 in initial capital from the life savings of Jeff's parents. And the idea for Amazon was simple. With the rapid advancements of the internet, Amazon would serve as a book shipping company that would operate fully online. And as soon as Amazon went live, the company's success was immediate. In fact, when the company went public in 1997, Amazon had already raised $54 million in just its first year. And then by 1999, this number had grown over 1000%. Everything was going perfectly. That was until the dot-com crash in March 2000, where every online business would be decimated. Even companies that Amazon itself had invested in, such as Pets.com and Cosmo, were financially ruined and vanished from the face of the internet. Amazon was bleeding profits every month, eventually losing 95% of their market value by the two-year mark, with their stock plummeting from over $100 per share to just $6. And the company was almost bankrupt by the tail end of the financial crash. However, unlike most, Amazon was somehow still able to remain afloat. And once 2002 came round, Amazon was back to making record profits. The survival of Amazon as a company is almost entirely attributed to Jeff Bezos' ruthlessly cost-efficient and intelligent managerial decisions. Although this approach wasn't anything new for Jeff, Amazon had been keeping their business expenses to the bare minimum throughout the dot-com bubble. In addition to this, the company employed a marketing strategy that allowed them to receive customer payments for books before they were bought by Amazon themselves, which meant the only items in their inventory were things customers actually paid for. However, there's a catch. In fact, according to a former Amazon engineer who worked at the company for over six years, Jeff Bezos makes, quote, ordinary control freaks look like stoned hippies. And Jeff wouldn't tolerate any dissent either, as Jeff was infamously known to hand out passive-aggressive sticky notes reminding employees who contradicted his orders who's really in charge and who's paying for their salary. In fact, Bezos had such disdain for his employees that he often remarked that employees should actually be paying him to work for the company. And once the storm of the dot-com bubble left, Amazon was back on track to making consistent profits. But Jeff's ruthless management would only get worse from here. Later in 2002, he issued a letter to his employees demanding that all of his computer engineering team who need to redesign their systems infrastructure from the ground up. And his message also included a nice little note promising to fire every single engineer who wasn't able to pull this off. But it was through this ruthless behavior that Amazon became the business we know today. And a few years later in 2006, Amazon would start to take over the world. It was in this time when they would launch Amazon Web Services, which quickly started to dominate the growing field of cloud computing. The service was initially a subsidiary of Amazon that harvested website traffic data to be sold to other online retailers. But eventually this service grew to be one of the largest websites hosting and internet infrastructure platforms in the world. Traditionally, if you're a company and needed computation, you would build a data center. But with all this cost and time, none of this would add any value to what the business was doing. It was just the price of admission for being online. At the time, Amazon was wasting so much time and money building data centers to sustain their monumentous growth. So Jeff's genius idea was to create the web services for everyone. By creating a service in bulk, Amazon became the cheapest and most reliable way of keeping your site online. And luckily for Amazon, Amazon web services faced no competition for around seven years. In the online world, this is unprecedented. Almost all new inventions are copied by at least two years. But by getting this big seven year gap to expand its share of the market, Amazon was now poised to control the entire internet. By doing this, Jeff Bezos cemented his power across the entire globe, all of which would become apparent in later years. But this wasn't the only thing Jeff was looking to capitalize on. He was always searching for new methods to take advantage of potential market growth areas. And it was through this mindset that led to the inception of Kindle in 2007. While smaller publishers initially favored Jeff's idea for this new kind of book distribution, they didn't realize how much disdain he had for the publishing industry. And once these publishers began to rely on Amazon.com for their sales, Jeff ordered his negotiators to approach them, quote, the way a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle, where he's 
started to demand more favorable contract terms that even Amazon themselves called to diss it. And after the Kindle launched, it only took three years for the book sales on Kindle to completely outsell hardbacks. And it soon became one of the primary mediums for people to read books. But a more sinister breakthrough was with Amazon Alexa, a voice activated speaker that interacts with your voice. Now this might seem like a seemingly simple and useful speaker, processing over 100,000 commands. However, this digital helper is a direct line to Amazon, where all your information is sent to the Amazon cloud. And I mean, everything you say, everything you command Alexa to do has all been recorded and stored permanently. And this information is extremely valuable to Amazon. In fact, this is where Amazon makes its money from Alexa. I mean, of course, Alexa itself isn't the product. That's why the smart speaker is so incredibly cheap. It's also that every time people around the world talk to Alexa, Amazon makes a profit. And by doing this, smart speakers are now in one in five households across the US. And then the more comfortable you get with Alexa being a part of your daily life, the more information and thus the more money Bezos can extract from you and the population. And who knows what's actually happening with this data. But it might raise some concerns considering that Jeff Bezos sits on a Pentagon board. Not to mention Jeff Bezos' $600 million deal with the CIA. However, before we continue, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access stops companies like Amazon stealing all of your personal information and data, and hides your online activity from your internet service provider, network administrator, and government sensors. And while helping safeguard your online privacy, their VPN software also blocks ads, trackers, and malicious websites. It does this by changing your IP address and rerouting your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel. In addition, Private Internet Access works with all major streaming services, which means you have unrestricted access to all your favorite content anywhere in the world. Added onto this is that the VPN's token-based dedicated IPs gives you 100% anonymity. And private internet access is now the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. They never record or store user data and their no-logs policy has been proven multiple times in court. Signing up for private internet access is risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 highly skilled customer support. And right now, private internet access is giving you guys a special offer. If you use my link in the description, you can grab an 82% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.11 a month. And you'll also have an additional three extra months completely free. So protect yourself by clicking the link in the description below. Despite all the new markets Amazon was beginning to conquer, this didn't alleviate Jeff's temperament. In fact, his outbursts were only getting worse. He was known to regularly go ballistic whenever he deemed an employee not meeting his standards. Or while he'd smile to the public looking like an innocent little nerd. But behind his fake laughs and smiling face was a monster. Many of those who received verbal lashings from Jeff noted that he flew into a rage so often that there would be a noticeable blood vessel bulging in his head during the tirades. The money Amazon was making also played no part in cooling Jeff's temper, as he was already a multi-billionaire by this point. However, billion weren't enough, Jeff wanted the world. And this would start to happen when the little known Jeff Bezos would become a household name. During this time, Jeff would begin his first step into major company acquisitions with his $250 million purchase of the then failing Washington Post. Jeff saw that although the company was being ran well in terms of physical newspaper distribution, they were really failing in the area of online mm -hmm. delivery. Looking back now, Jeff's reasoning for acquiring the news outlets is fairly questionable, with him explaining that the advancements of the internet was quote, eroding all the traditional advantages that newspapers had. And who knows what he really meant by by that, but the Washington Post was now essentially a mouthpiece for Jeff to say whatever he wanted, using the legacy and trust the company had built up over decades. And while the company did start financially succeeding under his management, it certainly wasn't because of an improvement in journalism quality. Jeff's newspaper is almost entirely interchangeable with all the other publishing outlets that spout the same neoliberal agenda. Quote, think twice before changing the tax rules to soak billionaires. However, not all business magnates are created in equal eyes, according to the Washington Post, as Elon Musk's recent Twitter purchase is something Jeff Bezos could not abide by. According to the newspaper, billionaires acquiring media platforms is now something to be worried about, since they could soon start having too much influence over the public, which is true, but this is coming from Jeff Bezos. But even more unsurprising is that through Jeff Bezos' control of the Washington Post, he now also controls the mainstream narrative surrounding him. Because of course, the Washington Post can't criticize anything about Jeff Bezos or Amazon. Even writers for the Washington Post working for other media companies can't criticize Amazon. There was a guy who was a writer for the Washington Post, wrote something in the Huffington Post that was critical of Amazon and he got disciplined at the Washington Post for doing that. Not to mention, Jeff Bezos has donated hundreds of millions to other major media networks like CNN and MSNBC. And by doing this, Bezos is always protected. Like for example, the time he cheated on his wife and began sending unsolicited pictures of his third leg. And after doing this, some of these photos were leaked. Now for any other person, this would get them canceled or labeled as a creep. 
crushing their reputation entirely. But if you have enough money and power, the media comes to your defense. Like the legacy Watergate journalist Bob Woodward, passionately supporting Bezos, telling him how proud and supportive he is of Jeff. With the Washington Post literally creating an article saying Jeff Bezos stands his ground. In fact, me telling you about this incident might be the first you've ever heard of it. And that's because Jeff Bezos decides who the media attacks and who it praises. However, when it comes to independent journalists, Jeff is very happy to send his team to docks and censor them into silence. Like when Jeff's Washington Post were going to harass the family of the lady running the Twitter page, Libs of TikTok. Because at the time the Post couldn't find Libs of TikTok, they would actually harass her family instead, threatening her innocent family saying, quote, you're being implicated in starting a hate campaign against LGBTQ people. The Washington Post published an article by Taylor Lorenz announcing Libs of TikTok's name, address, and real estate licensing information. So it starts to be pretty clear the other reason why Jeff controls so much of the media. It's convenient for Amazon hiding a lot of disgraceful and borderline illegal acts, which if the public found out, would destroy Jeff Bezos' reputation for life. I mean, the people fueling Jeff Bezos' riches live in dystopian squalor, with Amazon's working environment being highly toxic. I mean, the company literally encourages workers to snitch on each other over the most minor of differences. Amazon literally has a system called the Anytime Feedback Tool, which is an internal company phone allowing individuals to complain in secret to their managers. A system kind of like the Gestapo. By doing this, this deliberately creates a workplace culture of tension and mistrust, which is extremely useful for Bezos to prevent unionization something Amazon does everything in their power to prevent. They have dedicated resources to prevent the formation of unions ever since the company's founding in 1994. This is accomplished by having employees under constant surveillance from inside the warehouses to private Facebook group chats being monitored by HR, and Amazon regularly holding meetings about why unionization would be bad for business. The company actually hires anti-union consultants and even posted job listings for intelligence analysis who can monitor labor organizing threats. Amazon is infamous for its anti-union propaganda. Like this presentation they sent out to the whole company, telling workers to snitch on one another when they hear phrases like compensation, diversity, robots, or injustice. This is how little they think of the workers. And when workers aren't ratting on one another, if they make a slight error, Amazon's new wristband will track and buzz workers when they make the wrong movements. It's at a point now where Jeff Bezos thinks so little of his workers that he treats them like human cattle. Considering these conditions Amazon employees are put under, it's no wonder a majority of them are attempting to unionize. Their conditions are some of the most brutal you can find in first world countries. These Amazon factories are analogous to sweatshops. Amazon also has numerous warehouse cameras using an algorithm that analyzes the efficiency of every subordinate's actions. For example, if you're moving boxes, you better do it fast because a computer is monitoring your every move, calculating how much time has lapsed between each of the items you interact with. Or if you're driving delivery trucks for Amazon, things aren't much better either. Shift schedules are so strict that drivers are often forced to urinate in plastic bottles or to prevent any clock time being wasted. At the start, Jeff Bezos used his media power to deny these claims, tweeting out things like, you don't really believe the peeing in bottles thing, do you? But after thorough investigation, Amazon was later forced to admit that the stories were true after multiple documents proved it. But even with the evidence coming out, Amazon avoided full responsibility by claiming the issue was quote, industry-wide. But I don't think it is industry-wide. I really don't think most companies are using algorithms to analyze and rank each of its workers. And the algorithm is deadly. If a worker falls below a certain threshold in the algorithm, these workers are then automatically fired. And not even by a real person, but just by a computer. This is exactly what happened to a 63-year-old army veteran who was terminated over problems outside his control, like locked apartment complexes preventing him from making deliveries. And even with all I've just mentioned, this doesn't even include all the exhaustingly long shifts, considerably low break times, and workplace injury rates that are three times the national average compared to other warehouse occupations. But Jeff Bezos does this for a reason. By squeezing every drop of sweat from his workers, he can then reinvest this into gaining more and more control. That's why Amazon has been purchasing companies specializing in home security, pharmaceuticals, self-driving cars, grocery markets, facial recognition technology, airlines, and now even space travel. But Jeff Bezos isn't only conquering the physical world. By using Amazon's web services, Amazon now controls 
into the internet, having full control of the switch for websites like Facebook, Twitter and Twitch. This is why when Amazon's web services go down, almost every other company falls down with it. I mean there's so many companies that rely on Amazon at this point, Reddit, IMDB, Spotify, Pinterest, Imgur, the CIA and over 80 other consumer brand websites. Despite the many platforms and businesses they provide for, this still doesn't stop Amazon from competing with them if it could turn a profit. This includes companies who rely on Amazon for hosting, as well as all those who sell their products through Amazon itself. A major example of this though can be seen with Netflix. Netflix, like almost all websites, use Amazon's web services. However, this is becoming very risky for Netflix due to Amazon setting up direct competition with Netflix through Prime Video. Music is another key industry the company is currently making steps towards, with Amazon Music now being a direct competitor to other services like iTunes and another platform they host, Spotify. Now you may be thinking, who would ever use that over iTunes and Spotify? But Amazon being an industry leader in voice recognition and virtual assistants means there is already significant potential. As we speak, there are people watching Amazon Prime Video while playing Amazon Music that's controlled by an Amazon Alexa they bought from Amazon.com, which of course runs on Amazon Web Services. All of this streamlining and centralization of products is why they are so intent on entering and cornering every possible market they can. Those who sell physical items through Amazon also have to deal with the company's massive influence, which allows them to dictate the cost of nearly anything being sold on the website. If pricing someone out doesn't work, Amazon can simply alter their search algorithms to benefit themselves and get the products they sell shown first. Because when it comes to competition, Amazon is absolutely ruthless. They have so much money that whenever another company tries to compete with them, Amazon can afford to sell at a loss until the competitor eventually runs out of business, making Amazon almost a monopoly. And despite this ethically questionable market strategy and the massive amounts of revenue the company generates on a yearly basis, they still consistently get tax cuts from the government. With these tax cuts happening, even though Jeff Bezos has gone on record in many occasions stating in interviews how hard he works to dodge taxes. I mean, have you ever wondered why Amazon was founded in Washington instead of California's Silicon Valley like almost every other big tech company? Well, Jeff has no problem admitting he did this entirely to avoid California sales tax. And throughout the company's history, Amazon's aversion to paying tax has become central to their name. Over the 20 years they've been operating, Bezos has been deliberately avoiding sales tax in the majority of other states. In 2018, the company reported an all-time high of over $10 billion in profits, and yet they paid a grand total of $0.00 in federal income taxes. But I guess there are some benefits to Amazon's ruthless rise. I mean, workers at Amazon can now live in a wagey cage. At least Amazon provides its workers a meaningful lifestyle, where they can work in a box, live in constant anxiety of being fired, we in their bottles, and then go back to their pod in a decaying dystopian megacity, where they'll be shuttled through grindly slow packed public transport through a dangerous urban sprawl only to repeat the cycle every day of every week of every month of every year, eating impossible Whopper burgers, ordering their foods, essentials and gifts all through Amazon, where they'll go back to work in an Amazon wagey cage, being fed constant propaganda from Bezos' media empire, spending their only free time on an internet that's infrastructure is controlled by Amazon. Not to mention all the apps and major sites that Bezos partially owns, where an Amazon worker can then go back to watch their Amazon Prime while listening to their Amazon music on their spying Alexa, paying taxes to a government that doesn't tax Bezos' inconceivable wealth, a government that actually begs Bezos to direct it. All of this to continue feeding Bezos' domination over you. And with our economy teetering on the verge of collapse, Bezos will then be able to buy up more businesses, more shares, more assets, and more wealth, becoming ever more in control of your daily lives. All while normal people are forced into factories, treated like human cattle, fed continual propaganda. All of this just to keep the same system feeding Bezos' swollen ego. It's clear that we now live in a world where elected officials no longer control our economy or politics. Politics. The democratic vote no longer exists. How could it, when billionaires have control of the entire world's infrastructure, control of the CIA, seats at the Pentagon, spyware in millions of households, algorithms that dictate the markets, and a personal fortune worth more than entire nations? Free market capitalism is no longer a unifying nation-building philosophy because we've abandoned meritocracy in favor of socialism for the rich, laboring under a society and economic system that has now abandoned all of us.